Turn your Bibles, if you would, to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13, I'm going to read quickly from a parable that most of you are familiar with. But oh, what application for us today. And you'll see how it relates to the topic I have here. After baptism, what then? Matthew 13, and I'll start at verse 1. On the same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea. And great multitudes were gathered together to him so that he got into a boat and sat. And the whole multitude stood on the shore. And he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside. That's another name for like a hard path that would go around the outside of the field and sometimes through the fields. And the birds came and devoured them, because the seeds were just lying on the soil, right? Some fell on stony places. These are often beyond the sides of the field, sometimes beside the paths, the hard paths, where they did not have much earth. And they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns. The thorns would often be found in near ditches, maybe near the field, or sometimes in the outskirts or the corners of these fields. And the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Now, going down to verse 19, Jesus explains the parable in terms of the life of one who hears the word. He said, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom, that's the gospel, and does not understand it. Now, it could be because they just don't care that much to pay close attention, or they could be too young to understand. Then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who receives seed by the wayside. But he who receives seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. I think many of us have known people like that who were so excited when they heard the gospel and wanted to obey it. And that's not a bad thing, by the way. Depends on the type of soil. Yet he has no root in himself. In other words, this is speaking of a person who hears the word, but they don't have sufficient maturity, really, to digest and let the word really live in their hearts. And again, it might be they're too young or for some other reason, they're just not mature enough really to understand. But endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. That is, his or her faith just is shattered and suddenly they just go their own way, as it were. Now he who receives seed on the thorns, among the thorns, is he who hears the word And the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. Now this refers to a person who might otherwise be mature and responsible, but they never gain the right priorities. Or if they do initially, they don't keep God as a priority very long. They just let all the other things going on in their life take precedence over God and over Jesus Christ. And so they, they, might, they might still have faith in God, might still have faith in Jesus, but they never produce fruit because they're too busy attending to everything else in their lives. And that's sad. And that's far too common. Well, we go on. But he who receives seed on the good ground, this is a person who's not only mature, but they understand nothing can come first. Before God, nothing. Is he who hears the word, understands it, and indeed bears fruit and produces, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. Now it goes without saying that all of us want to be that good ground Jesus spoke of. To be the type of person that understands the word, puts God and Jesus first, and bears fruit does many great things for the kingdom of God, and actually contributes to others coming into the kingdom, being saved. But that doesn't happen by accident or luck. To a great extent, we determine the type of soil or ground that we are, in a figurative sense. 
And although the person we are, we were, I'm sorry, before we obeyed the gospel, our character, so forth, might have some influence on the type of soul we are. It's what we do after we rise from the waters of baptism that has the greatest influence of all on the type of soil we are. So, thus, after baptism, what then? Now, this lesson is designed to help any Christian. But it is vital, and I mean vital, for those who have been Christians, say, a year or less. I think it's going to be especially beneficial. No, I won't even say that. I'll say it is Almost mandatory. This is just so, so important for newer Christians. And again, it will help us all. Now, there's going to be two parts to this lesson. I'll preach part one this morning. Next Sunday, God willing, I'll preach part two. But it's so imperative that newer Christians especially hear these lessons. All right, so to begin with, let's see if we can move on here. I want to share some things that a new Christian really should know. In fact, I'll change should know to must know, all right? Number one is a new Christian. You are a disciple of Christ. Now, where do we get that? And you'll see the scriptures here if you want to take notes. And by the way, I will have outlines of these lessons. I'll put those on one of those stands out there beside the auditorium after the lesson today. But they'll contain all the points, all the scriptures used in the lesson. So where do we get disciple? Go to the Great Commission, Matthew's account. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. Jesus commanded his apostles. Go, therefore, and make disciples, disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Here we hear this word disciple. By the way, in Acts chapter 11, verse 26, we read that the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. But they were first called disciples. Just understand that. So what is a disciple? A disciple is a student or more accurately, an apprentice, one who has so much interest in the subject or the teacher that he or she just commits to spend the rest of their lives, or as long as it takes, learning everything possible about that subject, or in this case, about that teacher and what that teacher taught. Jesus said, go and make disciples, teach them enough about Jesus with that, he becomes a priority to them, and they say, I want to learn everything possible about this man. Jesus also, in Matthew chapter 11, 28, 29, talks about this idea. He said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Learn of me. Learn everything you can, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest to your souls. So, We must know that we are disciples, we're learners, we're apprentices apprentices of Jesus Christ. Next, you should know that you've been added to Christ's church. And this is very important for new Christians to know. In Acts chapter 2, verse 41, we read about these new Christians. Then those who gladly received his word, that was the word Peter preached, convincing them Jesus was the Son of God, telling them when they said, what shall we do? Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. They were added to the group of disciples that presently existed. Now, how did they get into that? How did they join that group? Or did they join that group? No, they didn't join. They didn't apply for acceptance. They were added. And how do we know that for sure? Going down to verse 47, we read, And the Lord added to the church, that is his church, as he promised to build in Matthew 16, 18, daily those who are being saved. So when someone is saved, obeying the gospel, God adds you to his church. You know, sometimes after I baptize somebody here in this building, someone will ask me afterwards, they say, okay, how do I join the church? I said, you don't join. You're part of it already. And hopefully you'll be a part of our church family here. We're just one part of the body of Christ overall in the world. But God adds you to it. So that's so important to know. Next, you must grow spiritually. Now, I guess we could say that's, you know, a given. But not every Christian gets that. Especially some of the newer Christians. Listen. 
2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, Peter said, but grow. He's talking to all Christians, even those who've been Christians for many years, but certainly it would apply to new Christians. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Keep growing. In Hebrews chapter 5, in fact, verses 12 through 14, the writer of Hebrew, Hebrews criticizes those Christians who did not grow spiritually and were still like new Christians, even though some of them had been Christian for years. Here's what he says. He says, for though by this time, you, those who have been Christians a long time, ought to be teachers. You should have sufficient knowledge of God's word to be able to teach it yourself. What a lesson is that? Listen, by the way, in about roughly three weeks from now, I'm going to preach a lesson especially for our teachers. But I'll tell you what, the real subject of that lesson is those who really need to be learning to be teachers. Okay? Because that's what the Hebrew writer is addressing here. He said, all right, for this time you ought to be teachers. You need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. It's like you need to go back to your ABCs. And you have come to need milk in a spiritual sense, which would be the basics, and not solid food. Deeper knowledge, deeper understanding of the word of God. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness because he or she just hasn't grown to the point where they really know it or understand it. For he is a babe. And again, he's talking to mature Christians here who should be far beyond the age of babes, right? But solid food belongs to those who are of, who are of full age, those who are mature as they should be. That is, those who by reason of use who have read God's word, applied God's word, reread it, reapplied it, have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. There's more I could say about that, but I'll tell you what, those who fail to grow in their knowledge and understanding and application of the word of God will get to a point where they accept almost anything because they just don't know any better. And that's what he implies. And then 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. Peter has some great instruction about growing spiritually. He says, but also for this very reason, and he's talking about to stay faithful, giving all diligence. In other words, give this your complete attention. Add to your, all right, where do you start when you become a Christian? You start by having faith in Jesus Christ. Faith comes by hearing, as Joe reminds us, and hearing by the word of God. Add to that, though, Virtue. Virtue would have to do with a sincere, honest heart. To virtue, knowledge. Learning more and more of God's word. For, oh, I'm sorry. To knowledge, self-control. That's hard. Self-discipline. As you grow in knowledge, you continue to grow in that as well. To self-control, perseverance. The ability to continue to be faithful to Jesus even during hardship. Perseverance, godliness, being more like God himself. To godliness, brotherly kindness, treating others in the kindest, compassionate, gentlest way possible, and to brotherly kindness, love. That's agape love, the Greek word for love, which means unconditional love. I'll talk about that in a future lesson. For if these things are yours, if you've been growing in these things and abound, then you'll be neither barren nor unfruitful. And all this is about being mature enough, godly enough to be fruitful in the knowledge of God, or in the knowledge of Christ Jesus. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his own sins. If you don't grow spiritually, folks, you're in trouble because you're going to forget what the Christian life is all about. All right, let's cover a few more. You must also know that you must continue to be faithful. Now, this kind of comes back almost to the last point, growing. The point we're going to focus on is this. There will be times. Now, if you're a newer Christian, you may have never experienced one of these times. Although, if you've been a Christian very long, you have. That you'll be tempted, the devil, tempting you to throw in the towel. To just give up. To say, ah, I can't do this thing. No. 
No. Jesus would never give a command that you and I couldn't obey. I'm reading from John chapter 15, verses 4 and 5. Listen carefully. Jesus said, abide in me. How do you abide in Jesus? You abide in his will. You continue to keep his commands. And I in you. And abide means to continue that way. Don't go in and out, you know, day by day. Well, today I'll be a good Christian. I'll really obey Jesus. And tomorrow I'll forget about it. And the next day, well, maybe I'll come back. No. As the branch cannot bear fruit. And that's what we're talking about today of itself. Unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Unless you continue to obey my will. I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. Again, for without me, you can do nothing. Folks, we've got to continue to be faithful. Colossians 1 verse 23, Paul says, If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, which means to persevere, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard. Paul also told Timothy, 2 Timothy 3, verse 14, but you must continue in the things which you have learned and have been assured of. You've just got to keep going. Early Christians did that. Acts 2, verse 42, those, some of these were Christians the very first day. And what did they do? They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. That would be the word, folks. And in fellowship coming together to worship, to be with other Christians, and the breaking of bread, a possible reference to the Lord's Supper, and in prayers. And finally, in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10, at the very end of that verse, John writes the Ephesian church, because they were struggling. He said, or this is Jesus actually speaking to them, be faithful unto death, and I'll give you the crown of life. Folks, we've got to be faithful. All right, just a few other things. Next are some things... Down at the bottom, that new Christians need to keep in mind. All right, things a Christian now must remember. Okay? Number one, you are, let's see, a new creature. Now, this portion of the lesson will be the most challenging of this morning's lesson. Because it's so easy to forget that. How do we know that we're a new creature? Just another expression for a new person better person. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things, that is the old life, the old ways, the old habits, the old sins have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Unless you were just one of the finest people that ever lived before you obeyed the gospel. After you obeyed the gospel, as you grow spiritually... You should become a better person. And this should just continue. That's what he's saying about being this new person. And this occurs again, starts when you're baptized. I'm reading from Romans chapter 6, 3 and 4. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ, were baptized into his death, we experience a death when we're baptized, not literally, but figurative. And where do we die from? That old life. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. So we experience a type of death that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, Jesus did die physically and came back to life. Spiritually, the same happened to us. Even so, we also should walk in newness of life. When we come up out of that water, we're not only forgiven of sins by the blood of Jesus Christ, but a new life starts there and should never stop. More to the point, I'm reading from Ephesians chapter 4, beginning at verse 22. Paul said that you put off, put off means to depart or discontinue, concerning your former conduct, that is back when you lived the way you want to live, the old man that grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust. You go back to that old man and you're just going to rot spiritually. And that won't be the worst, okay? And be renewed in the spirit of your mind, which is going to be based on your learning more and more of God's word, and that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Folks, we are a new creature in Jesus Christ, and we must never forget that. 
Going back to Romans chapter 6, I'll read verses 12 and 13. And this is really the point he's trying to emphasize because the biggest issue you and I will ever have as Christians, whether we've been Christians a day or 50 years, is returning to some of that old life, especially those old sins. Romans 6, 12 and 13, Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body. Just because we're Christians doesn't mean we're not tempted anymore. No, the devil will work harder on us. I'll cover that later on. And we will at times give in to sin because none of us is perfect. John says, if you say you have no sin, you're a liar. All right? But we can't let sin dominate, control, take over our lives because that's what the devil wants. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lust. And do not present your members. Now listen, he's talking now about the physical body as instruments of unrighteousness to sin. Don't let yourself just give in to sin and let your body be used as a tool of the devil. But present yourselves to God, your bodies and your hearts and your souls as alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness of God. When you can use yourself, your body, your hands and feet, everything you have for God's glory, you're going to bear fruit. A lot of it. All right. A few more points here and we'll be done for the morning. As a new Christian, you must remember that you are in a critical, critical period. You see how, regardless of how old you are age-wise, when you obey the gospel, you are a babe. Spiritually speaking, Hebrews 5, verse 13, you're a babe in Christ, which makes you vulnerable to temptation, to discouragement, and false ideas or doctrines. And Paul hints at this very vulnerability in Ephesians 4, verse 14. He says that we, and he's speaking to those, those who've been Christians for years, should no longer be children, kind of we alluded to earlier, we should no longer be just babes in Christ, Here's why, because babes in Christ are tossed to and fro. The devil just works on us, all right? Throws us this way and that with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. And as a new Christian, you're so susceptible to that. Why? 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Be sober. Be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Folks out in the wild, predatory animals, when they're hungry, they look first for the youngest of the prey. And if there's no young prey, they look for injured or maybe sick prey, but first they look for the youngest animals they can find because they're most likely to catch them and the devil is the same way. That takes us to this next point, which will be our real closing point for today. We won't be able to finish all these scriptures. God willing, we'll do that next Sunday. But a new Christian rem must remember that God will help you to be faithful. You're not alone in this. The last passage from this that I'll read is Hebrews chapter 13, 5 and 6. Hebrew writer says, Therefore, let your conduct be without covetousness, a great desire to have the things of this world. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I, what in this world is greater, more sufficient than God? Nothing. And he says, this is why you don't have to be covetous. And because God says, I'll never leave you, nor forsake you, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. What can man do to me. Again, we'll pause right there and content, conclude next Sunday morning, God willing. But again, I can't overemphasize the importance of these lessons for newer Christians. Did you know that about 60% of all new Christians within 12 months will no longer be faithful or be duped into following some other religious group? 60% within 12 months. Why? For large part because they just haven't understood these things that I've shared this morning and will share next week. And by the way, in addition,
Beginning on Sunday, November 17th, our Sunday adult Bible class will begin a special study, particularly helpful for new Christians, helpful for all Christians. Some of you may remember the old Jewel Miller Visualized Bible Study Series. It's had three basic renditions since they first came out with that back in the 50s. They just came out with the fourth, which is an updated version of it, and high definition. We'll actually be watching those on Sunday mornings, and, and we'll go through the quizzes that go with them. That is such an outstanding study. A great review for people who've been Christians for a long time, but it'll be certainly helpful for newer Christians. But let me just quickly, before I close this morning, go back to the previous point. God will help you to be faithful. Understand this. If you do your part, He will give you all the help you need. Here's what I mean. I said the last passage, but I'm reading from 2 Thessalonians 3, 3 and 4. Pay close attention. Paul said, but the Lord is faithful who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. And then he adds, and we have confidence in the Lord concerning you, both that you do and will do the things that we command you. As long as you're doing your best to obey God, He will strengthen you and settle you and help you to be strong. But as soon as you turn your face the other way, God can't help you anymore. It's so important to stay faithful to Him. Thank you so much. If there's anyone this morning who has never obeyed the gospel, never confessed their faith in Jesus, never repented of their sins, and are ready to give your life to Jesus Christ, then obey his command to be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit so that you can have the forgiveness of all your sins and you can be added to the Lord's church. Now, there might be somebody here who just needs our prayers for strength, restoration. We'd be happy to pray for you. If you need to respond to the invitation, would you come up and have a seat up front as those of us who can stand and sing the song together? <laughs>